Lecture 9, Part 2, Earthquake Hazards, with specific attention to tsunami hazards. Here's a figure that keeps coming up for us. We've seen this a couple times before, or versions of it. This is just the correlation between seismic activity, or seismic hazards specifically in the upper one, and plate tectonic boundaries. Notice there's a clear and distinct overlap. The greater hazards are closer to the tectonic boundaries, you guys have seen this relationship time and time again. The reason this keeps coming up is because it is the driving force of seismic activity, that being plate tectonics. Mind you, we now know the specific details of uh, the association between faults, faulting, elastic rebound, and earthquakes, but keep in mind that the, those are all merely side effects of the big picture, that being tectonic plate activity. Thinking about those forces at play, those stresses, compressional, tensional, and shear, or friction, it makes sense that we see the largest risk associated, or largest amount of hazards, uh, associated with convergent boundaries, that compressional stress. Depending on the magnitude and intensity of an earthquake, we can expect to see quite a bit of damage or hazards associated with that event. When it comes to trying to have control over that situation, the best thing we can do is be prepared. Someone told me recently that there is no such thing as poor conditions, uh, weather or otherwise. It's just uh, people not being prepared enough. I, I don't think I agree with that entirely, but it certainly helps to be prepared and make preparations and, and build things to resist uh, large vibrational energy, and specifically with earthquakes. Now, monitoring and prediction is just one piece of that big puzzle. Unfortunately, it's pretty difficult to near impossible to say specifically when an earthquake will occur and how bad it's going to be. This is because we're dealing with rather short-term predictions. Re remember that geologic time moves rather slowly in comparison to our time. There are, however, a few clear warning signs or red flags that we can be observant of. Number one, we talked about in the first part of this lecture, four shocks. So if we are noticing a, an increase in the frequency and magnitude of four shock earthquakes, that means that we can expect sometime relatively soon to see uh, the main event. And we'll look specifically at the amount of time occurring between those four shock earthquakes. The closer together they are, that's that's really when we're looking at uh, having lesser window of time between that occurrence and the, the main shock. Also need to consider the history, the seismic history of the area. Uh, for example, when we look at the seismic history of Michigan, it looks really quite different from the seismic history of much of California, and that's for obvious reasons that we went over last uh, part of the lecture. And because of that, we can set a, a baseline expectation in regards to uh, making building preparations and what materials we're using and things like that. Other things that'll put the anticipation of a main shock earthquake on our radar Surface deformation, remember uh, elastic rebound can change the surface topography slightly, so if we're noticing some slight changes in uh, the surface, it's deforming, deformation, that can be one sign. Uh, changes in electrical resistance of rocks, uh, remember this is an exchange of energy, so that, simply put, can alter the way that new incoming energy can pass through that rock. Um, We'll see if there's already more energy going through it. We'll see higher energy, so on and so forth. This is a, a, a relatively new development in earthquake monitoring within the world of geophysics. So we can run electrical resistance surveys where we look at how resistant is the subsurface to electrical impulses. So we stick a bunch of metal probes in the ground, we send out electrical shocks, and then eventually we'll get some feedback from that as, as things bounce off of the subsurface and come back to us. And depending on the, the strength of the returned signal, we can sort of gauge uh, whether that's a normal level or not. Changes in groundwater level can be a good sign as well, or bad sign, uh, depending on which way you're looking at it. 
this can be either up or down. It just depends on the type of aquifer hosting that, uh, that water. Much of the sur subsurface and areas that are prone to earthquakes are fractured rock rather than here in Michigan, like if we go out and dig down, we're going to find clay, sand, and gravel. Uh, our aquifers mainly are, are hosted within the small pockets of uh, empty space in between those sand and gravel grains. Whether it's out west, say in California, keep coming back to that example, with this fractured rock, the, the water is actually uh, in between the these small micro fractures within all this rock. So if that foreshock activity either creates new fractures for water to flow into or uh, shifts the rock so that the small space between those fractures becomes smaller, like they slide down into each other and become closer, um, minimizing that space in between for water to occupy, we can see uh, either water levels go up or down. It just We're looking for a change period. Increased emission of radon gas. Some of you here in Michigan, it's very popular in uh, older homes, especially in historical districts like the Stewart neighborhood of Kalamazoo, um, for homes to have cement block basements. Those ha uh, commonly have issues with an uh, increased level of radon. Most of those houses now also have radon mitigation systems. Radon is a radioactive gas that is odorless and can cause uh, lung cancer with enough exposure. It is uh, a gas that lives within soils and fractured rock. It's a byproduct of a, a series of radioactive breakdown reactions. But anytime that we're building something that goes down into the soil or down into the fractured rock, such as a basement, uh, we want to make sure that we have a good seal or good airflow um, to either keep that radon from seeping in or if it does seep in, to flow it out. And uh, rad most radon mitigation systems are just taking the air from the basement and flowing it out. And so when we have these cement blocks built together, uh, that presents a really good opportunity for that radon to slip in. When we have an increase in uh, seismic activity, that energy flow can sometimes push out additional radon gas. So if we see an increase in the emission of that radon gas, that can sometimes uh, be a prelude to more seismic activity. Also relatively new in the world of earthquake monitoring is looking at radio signals from both rock strain and saline groundwater. This is still being debated uh, on how effective this is and how uh, strong of a predictor this can be, but the idea is that we're looking at the level of interference. Radio waves are uh, just low level frequency waves, so if they uh, are perturbed in any way, we can somewhat easily see that, but there are a lot of other things that can produce that kind of signal. So it can be hard to determine whether that's coming from foreshocks or um, further out seismic activity that can precede a main shock or a number of uh, other man-made interferences. So this last method is still in the works. It's very much uh, still in its development stage. What seismologists really have a better handle on is long-term earthquake prediction. Long-term earthquake prediction is far more statistics than anything else. We know that in areas that are seismically active, so plate boundaries, we can expect that the longer amount of time we go without having a main shock earthquake, the, the larger the intensity and magnitude of the next earthquake uh, will be, and that's because this is just a, a longer period of time for it to build more and more tension. The more tension is built, the more energy it's holding internally, which means the larger energy release will come once it reaches that breaking point. So the entirety of long-term earthquake prediction surrounds the idea of probability versus time. On the right here, we have a figure by the USGS. This is showing the hazard levels. So uh, pink being the most intense and white being the least or no intensity uh, associated with 
what's expected for it to happen sometime in the next 50 years. And this model is partially built on uh, monitoring levels of subsurface motion, uh, but primarily this is built on statistical probability because it's a function of time. And these kinds of models can be rather hard to build depending on what time scale it is that we're looking at, and that's because we really only have record of earthquake occurrences going back so far at the most a few hundred years. And the further back we can go, as you can imagine, the, the less detail we have about that seismic event. Because our man-made records only go so far back in time, uh, one loophole that we have in that is the rock records. So we can uh, start digging trenches and looking for evidence of seismic activity, mainly that's looking at faults. When we find these uh, evidence of seismic activity, in whatever time range it is that we're looking for, considering we can try and get a more specific date by grabbing a sample and sending it off to a lab for carbon dating. Something else that we see in seismically active areas are seismic gaps. These are smaller areas within that larger active area where there is localized inactivity or low levels of activity seismically. In these localized areas of inactivity or low level activity is where we can see the highest levels of strain being built up. This is because, the, recall that the overall area is experiencing a lot of seismic activity, it's releasing that strain, but for some reason uh, there's a, a higher localized level of strength in that subsurface, which means that it can withstand higher levels of stress. However, it's still going to eventually reach that breaking point because there's still all of this other seismic activity happening. So that stress level, that internal stress level is increasing and increasing. Eventually it will need to release. So we can map out these areas, like this example here for the southern coast of Alaska. And we can see all of these pink pockets really are, are seismically active areas, but there are a few seismic gaps uh, that are rather small and in these little pockets here. There's one main one right in the middle here where there is some residual activity but there's a quite a big pocket in here where we're not seeing anything. This is a place where we can expect to see a rather high intensity and magnitude earthquake sometime in the relatively near future because it's going to need to release that internal tension. A couple other spots on here where we can expect to see the same thing as well. The Cascadia subduction zone is another example of a seismic gap. This is right by the North American plate um, boundary and Juan de Fuca out to the west there. So to give you a little bit more context, here's the uh, Canada and state of Washington boundary right there. It's Vancouver and Seattle. Uh, this whole area is a seismic gap and from what we can tell by digging down and, and looking at fault structures and getting those samples and carbon dating them is that these uh, large magnitude earthquakes somewhere between 8.7 and, and 9.3, uh, you know, that's getting closer and closer to some of the largest uh, earthquakes that have ever occurred, uh, have been released on cycles of somewhere between every 300 to 600 years. So that's how long that tension can build for. The last time this happened was uh, about in about 1700, so we are now within that reoccurrence pocket. It could happen uh, tomorrow, it could happen another 240 years from now, uh, hard to say. Southern California is also on the wait list for a quote unquote big one to occur. Uh, there is a 99% chance of probability of an earthquake with a magnitude equal or greater to 6.7 occurring in the next 30 years. The areas being most at risk for this uh, being San Francisco and Los Angeles. Uh, recall that magnitude scale, so think about where 6.7 lands on that. We're expecting extensive damage and possible loss of life with this event. There are two different categories of hazards for earthquakes, that being direct and indirect. So direct are the obvious ones, so ground rupture, fracturing in the, the surface, and 
and shaking off the ground. And then everything else, the indirect hazards, are side effects of those direct hazards. So as a result of ground rupture and shaking, we can have landslides, liquefaction and ground subsidence, tsunamis, fire, so on. Ground subsidence is when, um, because of that shift in subsurface rock, we may see a superficial shift in the topography of the land. So uh, this can, we talked about deformation earlier. This is a type of deformation. The subsidence is specifically when it, there's a portion that drops down. And then liquefaction is when our soil has a high enough water content and is charged with enough energy that it can behave partially uh, as a liquid. So what you see here is uh, a class doing an example of with liquefaction. So what the teacher is having them do, as you saw them all just standing at a normal beach, is they are energizing that uh, high water content soil or sand. Looks like there's a good amount of clay content there as well. And you can actually see in real time as they begin to charge the subsurface with the energy that they're uh, putting into that, it's starting to behave uh, less like a bunch of sand solid and more like a liquid body. So as it goes on, this continues. They're increasing the tension uh, within that body. And eventually this will start to be like quicksand. Skip forward a little bit here, you can see now she's had all of her students move away because it, it is quicksand at this point, but she is moving herself deeper and deeper into it um, because it can now behave uh, like liquid. If you guys don't know how to get out of quicksand, the best way to do that is to try and become horizontal. You can see she's quite deep now. But she wiggles out one foot, gets it higher, and she's trying to displace her energy by making herself horizontal to that and slowly working her way up and out of it. And she's free. In parts of the world with a lot of seismic activity, we have seismic engineers who work on seismic engineering. This is specifically building things uh, with structures resistant to seismic activity. They're meant to survive earthquakes of certain magnitudes. Really, the whole name of this game is displacing the energy, much like uh, the teacher in the, big, the YouTube video we just watched did in order to get out of the quicksand. So one example of this is we can have cross bracing. This is uh, putting braces in uh, X formation so that they are put in between the parallel uh, framework of a building so that it just has an additional support. Another tactic, one of the cooler ones even, is a mass dampener. These are usually very large concrete blocks that are suspended in the middle of skyscrapers. So uh, skyscrapers are particularly vulnerable to lateral movement. And what these do is they will offset the weight of that movement. So if the, the tower is leaning to the right, this will move to the left and help get it back into equilibrium. Uh, one example of this is the Taipei building. So this has a steel pendulum or mass dampener that weighs 660 tons. It is suspended from the 92nd floor to the 88th floor uh, and it decreases the resonant amplifications or really that lateral movement and helps balance things out. And this is not only helpful with earthquakes but also really strong winds. The catastrophic damage from earthquakes that you guys have seen footage of in the news or in documentaries uh, is usually going to picture some failed concrete columns from uh, highways or uh, train tracks or whatever we have suspended uh, above the road. Now, one easy fix for this is we can put steel jackets around these columns. We can also retrofit them with steel spiral wrapping. Uh, and both of these are just ways to reinforce those columns so that they're less likely to break under uh, a given amount of stress. This is also one of the cheapest solutions that we have for this. One other type of seismic engineering that we have, this is one of the more common things, is the use of um, 
base isolation. So this is usually done using either rubber bearings or steel springs. These go on the bottom of buildings and the purpose of this is to absorb that energy and allow the entire building to move in unison. So um, the shaking back and forth is because of that energy wave propagation. If the springs absorb that movement and then shift the whole building, then the building be uh, is left undamaged. If there's no absorption there and we have these waves propagating through, it will shift the different parts of the building at different rates. As you can see that the, the little figure here moving sideways, uh, that's why those curved lines are shown. And that's really what causes the damage, is because their parts are moving different relative to one another. Here is a video of a building which has these in place. And it almost looks like the person taking the video is swaying back and forth, but they're not. This is a fixed camera that's the building swaying back and forth. And you can see that the building is, is moving, but it's relatively undamaged. All of these seismic engineering efforts are things that are obviously done well in advance of a seismic event. However, we also don't have situations where we don't have as much uh, preparation in place. So we can use the earthquake early warning system. Uh, a bunch of countries have their own versions of this. In Japan, they uh, it's organized by the Japan Meteorological Agency, or JMA. And this is taking advantage of what we talked about in lecture one, looking at the SP interval. So uh, once that reaches a certain degree of warning, they will put out a broadcast to several stations and emit a warning to all of their people. Now, uh, the difference in warning between even a few minutes or seconds can, can be life-saving. It's enough of a chance to get under something to prevent um, heavy objects from falling on you and crushing you. This is what the Japan um, early warning system looks like. It'll bounce onto the TV much like what uh, we do for tornado warnings. So shows a figure with where the action is at. Emergency earthquake warning, watch out for this area. Goes on, tells people to get under desks and other objects, protect yourself, keep away from objects that may fall over, get under a table or desk. When the emergency announcement was sent out and what areas are at risk. Tsunamis can be one of the most damaging hazards of earthquakes. This is the result of some sort of vertical displacement in the sea floor. Um, it has to be out at some depth of the water so that it can actually send that energy towards the shore, uh, usually about 90 feet minimum of water. This vertical displacement can be a submarine landslide happening because of an earthquake. Um, it can even come from large meteor impacts or from the actual plate convergence at a convergent boundary itself. You can think of a tsunami and the way that the energy moves through the water, similar to how some people make their beds in the morning. Um, I was trained to do military uh, tucking, so not the way that I made mine, but some people like to just grab their comforter, stand at the foot of their bed, give it a good whip, and it flattens out and lays peacefully onto the top of the bed. Uh, easy peasy, few seconds of energy and effort. The reason that the comforter is able to flatten out like that is because when you whip it, you raise your arms up into the air abruptly and then push them down, you're creating that vertical displacement and putting that energy f into a forward motion. And it, that wave of energy actually propagates through that comforter, which flattens it out. I've seen some videos online where people can get that whip just right to where the, the top of the comforter by your pillows actually folds over. Uh, just to have another aesthetic to it. But kind of the same thing happens with tsunamis. Look at these figures here. This is a step-by-step -step, uh, progress in time. 
So if we look up here, this is where we have a convergent boundary with the, an oceanic subducting plate. So it's, there's some sort of, there's some friction here and we're getting some uh, built up energy here. It's, it's continuing to converge and we can see this slope increasing until eventually it reaches some point where it ruptures. And that rupture is like, when you take your, your bed sheet up and then you whip it down as quick as you can, that's going to send this wave, or this, that's going to send this wave out towards the shore. And it's going to propagate into the, the massive waves that we see as tsunamis. It should come as no shock. That's the tsunami hazard map, uh, the global map overlaps uh, almost exactly with the earthquake hazards map and the tectonic plate boundaries map. Now there are a few areas here that really haven't been studied too much. Those are the ones circled in gray, but you can see the ones that have the greatest wave height and the greatest potential for damage, greatest hazard, uh, in the dark red coloration. Look along the west coast of North America there and the east coast of Asia you can see that those are where we have the highest tsunami risks. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration by the U.S. government, uh, otherwise known as NOAA, has a monitoring system for tsunamis in areas that are at higher risk, such as California. The newer monitors that they use are called DARTs, or Deep Ocean Assessment and Reporting of Tsunamis. Uh, they're essentially radio buoys. The way that this works is they put these uh, some a good distance off of the coast, and there's a two-part system. One, they have a sensor, which is anchored to the seafloor, and then the radio buoy, um, which is anchored very close to that. The sensor on the seafloor monitors for very minute changes in pressure. For every foot of water that's above uh, the sensor, we know how much pressure that should be exerting on the on the sensor. So if there's a change in pressure, that is a proxy or indicator that there's a change in the amount of water above that sensor. If there's a rapid increase in pressure or rapid increase in the height of water above the sensor, the depth that's telling us that a, a possible tsunami wave is coming through, it triggers the sensor to send out a signal to the radio buoy, which then sends a larger signal out to the monitoring stations. And then the monitoring stations can assess that warning, make sure that it's valid. If it is, they can send out a warning to uh, whatever city that's located in and provide their constituents with fair enough uh, time to prepare for that incoming tsunami. And that whole process usually happens within just a few minutes from the point that the sensor is triggered to the point where NOAA sends out the warning message. Because earthquakes cause damage, we have a subsector of engineering just for seismic activity in preparation for those events. We also have a subsector of engineering specifically for tsunami preparation. One of the main parts of that is creating tsunami barriers or walls. Uh, the idea of this is you put a big wall in the way, keeps the water from coming in and inundating things you don't want inundated or flooded. These are primarily done in urban areas. Um, in less urban areas, it's been found that uh, enough vegetation with a high enough strength, usually trees, something with a good thickness to them, can be just as effective, if not more effective, than engineered walls. So a lot of countries subject to uh, tsunami risk have been experimenting with this in the recent decades. You know, the main catch with this is that it, it takes much longer to build than uh, a constructed tsunami wall. You can pre-grow the trees to some degree and then bring them out and plant them, but you have to wait for the roots to become established and intertwined. And if you have a tsunami event that comes in before that happens, then all of that work is destroyed. So tree walls can last longer, uh, they're less expensive, and they can be more effective in some cases than constructive walls. However, there are uh, its own risks associated with this method as well. Another precursor to tsunamis is ocean withdrawal. So you can see in these images here, uh, more so the one on the bottom, where the shoreline originally was. It's where this brown sediment meets the dry 
light tan sand that's where the water used to come up to and it's been drawn back because of that transfer of energy and incoming tsunami wave. Uh, people who live in these areas are pretty used to this and so they know not to go out during that time but unfortunately um, there have been many cases where tourists think that it's just a drop in sea level, it's a good time, it's low tide, it's a good time to go out and look for shells, that sort of thing, and they've been trapped and killed uh, in tsunamis. So if they're out there by the time that they see the tsunami wave incoming, they're dead. Uh, tsunamis move at an average speed of about 500 miles per hour, that's about as fast as a literal jet plane. If they're out on the flat, they don't stand a chance. So if you ever happen to be a tourist visiting any of these seismically active areas, if you experience an earthquake, it's a good idea to just stay away from the beach for the period of time immediately following that. Now, I don't love to end on dark notes, so please enjoy this meme. A couple of reminders for you guys. You need to complete your tectonic plates infographic if you haven't already. Don't forget to take the lecture quiz as always. Next week, we're getting into uh, Michigan geology for lab. If you bring an interesting rock that you found somewhere in Michigan to lab and you can tell us where you found it and why you think it's interesting, I'll give you two points extra credit. Also, lab is online this week. You're going to be watching a documentary and writing a summary. Reply to other people's summaries. Try and ask questions. Uh, you know, I don't want to be the, the person that assigns you a boring summary and you have to reply to people and say, that's interesting, I agree. Um, you know, focus, feel free to focus on the part of the documentary that was actually interesting to you. I don't need a full summary. Just talk about what it is that really captured your attention during that. Ask questions if you have them. Somebody else might be able to answer them. Try to have a conversation with people. All right. You guys have a good week. I'll see you next time.